Now for our next speaker. So, before turning his hand to politics, he was also a business owner, and in 2005 became an MP for South West Surrey. Since then, he has served and led in numerous departments across government, including health and social care, the Foreign Office, and now the Treasury. I have welcomed the constructive discussions we've had on the challenges facing business and know that we have a shared ambition to maximise economic growth and make the UK the best place to start and grow a business. And I look forward to continuing our positive relationship. So, please join me in welcoming the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. Jack it off. Love yes, it. down to Love business. It. Down to business. Shirt sleeves rolled up. Um, Chancellor, it's a great honour to have you here today. We know it's a really busy time and I think everybody in the room really, really appreciates it. Um, before we get into some of the more topical issues, one question that I'm very keen to know from you is, what was it like at, at the start of, of, of your job? Because there you are, um, going about your, 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 your business, your backbench business, and you get the call from, from Liz Truss after the, the mini budget. What, what was that like? It was a bit surreal, Aisha. I mean, I, I thought I was comfortably consigned to the back benches and obscurity um, <laughs> for the rest of my life and um, thoroughly enjoying myself, actually. And um, I got a text message saying, this is Liz Truss, please call. And I thought, this is going to be a hoax. And uh, I was actually on a weekend away with my wife in Brussels. And... Um, I said, I can't believe these hoaxers who keep, uh, <laughs> uh, who keep uh, thinking I'm going to get caught out. And we went down and had a lovely breakfast downstairs. Um, and finally, I was called by a former special advisor who says, no, I think Liz Truss really is trying to get in touch with you. And so I hesitantly called the number 10 switchboard and said, I think this is a hoax. And they said, no, 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 the prime minister does want to speak to you. And so it was a rather uh, surreal moment. But um, Siobhan mentioned that I was... You know, I come from a business background. I set up and ran my own business for 14 years and before I came into politics. And there is no greater privilege for someone who has been through the hard graft of setting up a business from scratch and going through all those challenges than to be responsible for our economy and for trying to make life easier for other people who go on the same path. And so even though there had been a, a lot of turmoil after that um, mini-budget, was it a really easy decision to make or did you have to sort of weigh it up because, you know, it was a lot to come in and deal with? Um, there were some immediate decisions which were difficult but quite obvious because we had to stabilise the markets um, and those were the decisions that we took in, in a few days. Um, the autumn statement that followed was not easy. I mean, I'm a conservative, and in order to bring down inflation and to restore stability, we had to cut spending and increase taxes. And those are very, very difficult decisions for any chancellor to take. Um, but I think the result of those difficult decisions is that we are now on a path where... Um, not just us, but people like the Bank of England and, and the markets believe we will bring inflation and interest rates down. And in the end, that's the most important single thing we need to make sure happens. Now, that is very much part of the, the promises that, that the Prime Minister ha has set out, halving inflation this year and growing the economy. But how confident are you that you can meet those pledges, given that inflation is still quite stubborn? and that growth is sluggish. Yes, we were not in recession 0.1, but we want to do better than that. Well, um, the independent forecasters say we will meet those targets, but what I would say is there is nothing automatic about bringing down inflation. There is a plan. We're going to stick to it. The Bank of England has their role through monetary policy and interest rates. We support them 150% in that. But we have our role in government. Uh, what I do on the fiscal side in terms of tax and spend has an influence. And if markets judge uh, that we are not getting our borrowing under control, 
uh, they will punish us with higher interest rates. And so I have a very important role. The government has a very important role. Um, and, you know, what I would say to people who are worried about levels of taxation is I agree with that. We have to get our taxes down, particularly our business taxes down. But the worst tax of all is inflation because inflation is a tax which you get nothing back for in return, but it eats away at consumers' confidence. It means they spend less on the businesses uh, represented here today, and it deters businesses from investing. And so that has to be the overwhelming priority for this year. Now, on taxes, you know, we know that, particularly for many on your side of politics, a lot of your backbenchers, are very upset at the, the high levels of tax, you know, with, particularly with fiscal drag, more people are being pushed into those higher tax brackets. And it's quite, it's a heavy, heavy tax burden at, at the moment. As we pitch all towards the, the general election, and if there is any headroom, are you keen to try and land some tax cuts to stimulate the economy either towards the end of this year or into next spring? Well, um we aren't in a position to know whether we're going to have any headroom at all, but my priority is to make this, and I, by the way, I completely agree with, with what Siobhan said, do not bet against Britain. I think we have got incredible opportunity in this country to be the most dynamic and innovative economy in Europe. Um, and part of that is to have competitive business taxes. And so I made it very clear in the budget that uh, my priority, I've introduced, I mean, if you look at the two big challenges facing people in this room, and we listened very carefully to what people like Siobhan have said, um, to expand, businesses want to know that they can recruit the staff they need. So we had an entire budget focused on labour supply, of which childcare was the biggest single measure, but there was big uh, measures on, uh, for example, people with disabilities who are much more able to work than they have been in the past because of uh, the ease of working from home, which is a big change. So we've been thinking a lot about labour supply. But the other thing is business investment. Mm -hmm. And we've introduced full expensing. Uh, we're one of only six countries in the OECD. That's the advanced economies, 38 countries in total. No other major European country has full expensing. That makes us, in tax terms, uh, the most attractive large European country to invest for capital. And that's something that everyone is saying really matters. They want us to make it easier for them to invest and grow their businesses. And, and those, um, that fully expensing, is that something you'd like to see continued on Absolutely. a long-term basis? I, I want it to be permanent. We've introduced it for three years, um, but we made it very clear that, that it is a priority to make it permanent as soon as we can afford to do so. Um, but that means that you know, in this country, if you make an investment this year, in next year's tax bill, you reduce the taxable amount chargeable for corporation tax by the full 100% of that capital investment. Now, we have lagged uh, France, Germany, and the United States in terms of our business investment for many years, and that feeds through into our productivity. Uh, and we need to increase that. And this is one of the ways that we can support additional investment by businesses. It helps all of you grow your businesses um, and uh, makes it easier to make those capital investments in IT, plant, machinery, all the things that are going to make you more efficient in the future. Now, another thing that um, Siobhan mentioned, and I think this is something that a lot of people in the room uh, feel very strongly about, is, of course, the skills in, in the, the labour market at the moment now. We're expecting some quite high immigration figures, which will, of course, combine legal migration plus refugees. And we don't know the exact figure, but it is expected to be high. Now, the OBR says that much of our growth is dependent on, on migration and lots of work visas are, are being issued to help plug these skills gaps. But there's still a lot of political pushback, even from some members of your cabinet. We've seen a, this conference as well taking place over the last couple of days, many people in your party and in the cabinet saying, no, 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 we have got to have lower immigration figures. Where do you stand on this? You know, many people in this room will say that we have got to have uh, migration coming in to fill those labor gaps. Or do you think we should be aiming for much lower figures? Well, the, the Brexit decision 
uh, whichever side of that debate you were on, um, was a decision to change our economic model towards being a high skill uh, and uh, high wage economy. And I think that's something everyone instinctively supports. And it was a decision to move away from being an economy dependent on unlimited low skilled migration. So um, we've got about a million vacancies in the economy at the moment, according to the labor supply figures that came out yesterday. And we have about 7 million adults of working age who are not in work. So what I was doing in the budget was going through the four groups of people who are not in work. Um, we've just talked about long-term sick and disabled. That's about 2.5 million people. Um, around a quarter of those say they would like to work. Uh, we also have a million people who are unemployed without any sickness or disability. So that group alone could fill the vacancies. Then there's 600,000 parents of uh, under fives, many of whom have been prevented from working by high childcare costs. The budget will reduce uh, their childcare costs by up to 60%. And then there's the over 50s, some of whom have been pushed into early retirement by the way the pension tax works, and we've uh, put forward a solution to that. So what I'm trying to do is to make sure that our businesses can find the labor that they need in order to make sure that recruitment isn't a problem. We will, at the margins, always be pragmatic. So, for example, we put care homes on the shortage occupation yeah. list, some uh, construction industry sectors, and we will keep talking to all of you about where there are um, short-term challenges. But the long-term future is to, I mean, if I give you an example, if we, we have um, about 76% employment rate of our adult population, which is about average for the OECD. Um, if we had the employment levels they have in Holland, we would have 2.7 million more people in work than we currently do. And Holland has a higher GDP per head than we have. So what we need to do is to tap into the incredible potential that we have at home at the same time, and as we make that journey, to be sensible and pragmatic about uh, the immigration requirements where there are particular pressures. And the point you make about investing in uh, the, the, the workforce that aren't active at the moment is a really important one. But that definitely will take time, and that involves a lot of partnerships with you know, FE colleges and, and the likes to try and move those people in, into work. But given that we know that this debate is very political at the moment about, about immigration, can you send an assurance to, to the members in this room that you will bang the drum for their needs at the cabinet table, even when there are dissenting voices and say, look, it is important for British business to get the skills they need. They can't wait sort of 10, 15 years. They do need those skills now. I don't need to bang the drum because the government is completely united on this. If you look at what's happened since uh, the Brexit vote, since we left the EU, since we left the single market, the government has been pragmatic when it comes to immigration requirements. Um, but we also want to work with you to be better at tapping into the potential that we have at home and to uh, help you make sure that, for example, you don't lose valued employees uh, when they have young kids. And, or uh, women who go through the menopause. Or indeed that, or older people who, who might have a back problem that uh, prompts an early retirement when actually they'd rather carry on working. So I think this is a collective effort to boost uh, or to make sure that we all remove the barriers to work for people who want to work. And one of the big removals of, of barriers which came out of the pandemic has been working from home. It's, again, it's become quite a divisive issue. Where, where do you stand on that? Um, I think it's something that, so I'm just gonna oh, yeah, sure. give myself thank a little you. bit of water. Oh, water um, well, thank you, thank you. I think it's something for businesses to find their own way through. Um, there are some very exciting uh, opportunities created by the fact that we've all learned to use Zoom and Teams for meetings. Uh, actually, one example is childcare. So, you know, it's not now the case that uh, someone who has a baby needs to be completely out of contact um, for a very for, for years and years. But they have to have their baby on the Zoom call. That's the joy of the, the and, Zoom and, call. And, and, and we all accept that, and it's, it's absolutely fine. So it gives lots of choices. Um, if you have a disability, it gives you the chance 
uh, and, and you, you have a mobility issue, um, you're in a wheelchair. Um, you know, a decade ago, there was a presumption that you wouldn't be able to do lots of jobs, which we don't now need to have. Um, on the other hand, um, there is nothing like sitting around a table, seeing people face to face, developing team spirit. And I worry about uh, the loss of creativity uh, when people are permanently working from home and not having those water cooler moments where they uh, bounce ideas off each other. And uh, not every great business idea happens in a structured formal meeting. And so I think um, that's why increasingly businesses are saying they want people back unless there's a reason. I think we will get to a point where the default is, uh, with the exception of uh, specific categories of work, like, for example, call center work, but I think the default will be you work in the office unless there's a good reason not to be in the office, and gradually we're getting there. Now, let's turn to um, the issue of the, the, the EU, and, of course, we, we've recently had this Windsor um, agreement, and that's definitely changed the mood with Britain's relationship with the um, EU. But in every survey that the BCC has done since Brexit, these surveys show that British business is still finding trade with Europe very, very difficult. Will you look at new ways that you can sort out issues like VAT and, of course, the sort of thicket of, of paperwork and, and red tape that many people in this room have to battle? Uh, we will always look at ways to reduce bureaucracy for businesses. Um, we have now a very solid framework for our future relations with the EU that has been settled by the Windsor framework, but more importantly, um, the goodwill that that has created, and I think it was a remarkable achievement by Rishi Sunak to negotiate that agreement. The goodwill that has created means it's possible to have conversations with the EU about all sorts of issues that previously we weren't able to do. So. We are committed to the trading arrangements we have. We think we can make them work. Um, what I would say, though, is that uh, we want to remain friends with our neighbors in Europe. I think Ukraine has also changed the mood music and helped them understand this wasn't the um, bitter, angry divorce that they feared. We are good Europeans, and we will be there for uh, fundamental uh, interests of European security and European values such as represented by Ukraine. But when I look at Europe, what I say is there is a fantastic opportunity for the UK. Um, look at, I mean, just on the very narrow issue of Brexit, um, we've grown faster than Germany since the Brexit vote, and the IMF forecasts that were published in Washington last month say that from 2025 they're predicting the UK will grow faster than France, Germany, or Italy. So we are absolutely weathering the change in economic relations that Brexit represents. You will represents. concede that it has been tough for, for a lot of people in this room and it has been tough for a lot of British businesses of all sizes. Any change in your trading relations with your biggest trading partner presents challenges. And the people in this room have also had to deal with you know, the energy price uh, shock, biggest since the 1970s, the, um, the pandemic. Uh, it's been a period where there have been lots of big things that have been very challenging for businesses to deal with. But the bigger picture is that we have an opportunity now uh, to become uh, Europe's Silicon Valley. Uh, if you look at the industries that the UK is doing the best in, they are the industries that are growing the fastest and are going to grow the fastest over the next uh, 10, 20 years. So I'll just give you some examples, because I, you know, I, I want to reflect some of Siobhan's optimism about our long-term prospects. I know it's been a very, very difficult period, but you know, life sciences, we have become in the last decade Europe's biggest life science uh, industry. We uh, provided one of the two big vaccines in the pandemic, the biggest treatment, dexamethasone, this country probably saved more lives across the globe than any other because of our science and research. Uh, technology, I obviously care about this because I was a tech entrepreneur myself, but uh, France has 36 unicorns, Germany 63. We have 144, more than double um, France and Germany combined. So we are doing uh, extremely well, and Microsoft, um, not Microsoft, Google just announced that they are centering their global 
uh, research effort on artificial intelligence in London. Um, clean energy, uh, second biggest renewable sector in Europe. We now get 40% of our electricity uh, from renewables. Um, we've become Europe's largest film and TV sector over that period. We have great strengths in advanced manufacturing. So I'm not saying, let's be absolutely clear, that we are Europe's Silicon Valley. This will be hotly fought over. But I think if you look at our track record and what we've achieved, if you look at the fact that we've got a very strong higher education sector, a very strong financial services sector, this is an opportunity for us. And that's why I think uh, we can be confident that we will have uh, tremendous growth going forward. But it's up to us, as every business person here knows, it's up to us to make the most of that opportunity. Now, we're just about to um, go to some questions. We're going to have some press questions, and then we'll take a couple of questions from um, the floor. So do um, get ready if you've got any questions. And just before I hand over to uh, the press, just one final question for, from me, again, on the B word, Brexit. A couple of nights ago, the, the godfather, the architect of, of Brexit, Nigel Farage, was on Newsnight, and he said that uh, Brexit had, had, been, had been a failure. What, what do you say to that? I think I've, I'm someone who is pre-2016 was on a different side of that argument to Nigel Farage. But my view is that when you make a change like that, it is up to us. It is our choice. Now, um, you know, if you look at the changes that Brexit has brought about, the one that's most significant for the people in this room as an opportunity is the fact that we have total regulatory autonomy. So there will be people here who have uh, grumbles and complaints about the regulators responsible for their sectors. But we are able to change the rules uh, under which our regulators operate uh, through decisions by the UK government in a way that wasn't possible when we were in the EU. So one small example of that in life sciences, in the budget I was able to announce that uh, from now on the MHRA, which in the pandemic showed itself to be one of the most nimble medicines regulators in the world. They were the first in the world to approve the COVID vaccine. They have decided that they will approve semi-automatically drugs that have been approved in America, Europe, or Japan. Um, and for people who come and get their drugs approved here, we will be the fastest regulator in the world to approve. So if you want to get drugs to market, you'll be able to do that more quickly here than anywhere else. That's a really exciting vision uh, for people who want to develop new medicines. And that regulatory autonomy is something where there's lots more work to do, but there's a really big opportunity for us uh, to create massive opportunities for the businesses in this room. Excellent. That is a Brexit benefit right there. Now, I think we are going to have um, some questions from the, the media to start off with. And I think we're going to take our first question from Simon Jack of the BBC. Thank you. Um, Chancellor, you'll know that uh, carmaker Stellantis has said it cannot meet post-Brexit rules of origin requirements due to come in at the beginning of next year and is preparing its life for, exp for tariffs on its exports, uh, threatening the future of plants here. What can you do about that? And secondly, under your predecessor and the person who hired you, the words industrial strategy were effectively banned. Is it time for the UK to have a clear industrial strategy? And when can businesses expect to see it? Uh, well, let me take uh, both those questions. They're very important. We do have an industrial strategy. We've been very clear about that. We've identified five growth sectors that we think uh, we will need to give special support to, um, which I listed earlier, but technology, life sciences, uh, clean energy, creative industries, and advanced manufacturing. Um, and uh, if you look at the budget, it was squarely focused on the two biggest issues facing business today, um, business investment, how to boost that, labor supply. Um, and I've uh, been very clear about our strategy. I called it the four E's, education, enterprise, employment, and everywhere as being the way that we are going to make ourselves uh, the most prosperous, innovative, and dynamic economy in Europe. So I think uh, it's... Actions, not words. Um, I'm very happy to call that an industrial strategy. Um, I'm very happy to call it a growth plan. But what it is doing is tackling the problems that British businesses face. And one of our uh, key growth sectors is 
automotive, uh, which is a very central part of the advanced manufacturing sector. It's a great British success story. And as we move to EVs, we need to have battery making capacity in the UK. Um, we um, have the ability under the post-Brexit trading arrangements to import EV batteries from other EU countries, um, but the reality is there is a supply shortage. Everyone is trying to develop supply of EV batteries, and so we need to have that supply here in the UK. The closer it's located to um, the factories that are making the rest of the car, the better. Um, and all I would say is watch this space because we are very focused on making sure the UK gets that EV manufacturing capacity. And I think we have our next question from Katie Prescott of the Times newspaper. Hi, Chancellor. Thanks very much for taking the question. Um, you alluded to it just then, and you've repeatedly said that you want to make the UK a science and technology superpower by 2030. But I keep hearing from tech businesses here in the UK about their frustration operating here. So Revolut uh, spoke to me recently about their um, irritation at onerous regulation, a crunch in talent and, and high taxes. Siobhan mentioned Paragraph in her speech, another company, a semiconductor business that's been very vocal about this as well. And then of course we heard from Microsoft, uh, their president Brad Smith saying that the European Union is a more attractive place to do business than the UK. Um, what do you say to these tech companies about this, these frustrations and, and how do you plan to try and keep them here? Um, well, the first thing is we are uh, not just Europe's biggest tech 